Welcome to this end of series special, where anything can happen. Spring is here, so it must be time for some spring cleaning. Since I did a feature on the ZX Microdrives way back in episode 27, and whenever I use the footage for reference in other episodes, it always worries me that not only is it 720p, but also there's not a lot of it. It would be good to grab some 1080p footage for anything else I needed in the future. The problem, of course, is does the hardware still work? And more importantly, what condition are the cartridges? I'm pretty sure the hardware would be fine. It's been kept in a safe, dry place and looked after very well. The cartridges, though, well, you can probably guess. Over time, the felt pads just disintegrate. This can, at best, stop the cartridges from working, because the tape can't be pushed against the reed head. At worst, it can come off inside the drive and cause all sorts of problems. A quick check and every single one of my cartridges were in various states of disintegration. I knew you can refelt them, so a quick search, and I bought some 8-track refelting pads and set about doing just one cartridge as a test. The felt pads needed cutting to size, and then the work begins. You have to get the tape out of the way using a pen, and then the old pads have to be removed. Usually they just fall off, with the metal bracket underneath needing a little bit of a scrape with a scalpel or craft knife to remove the remaining bits. A quick wipe with some alcohol, and it's ready for the new pad. And this is the tricky bit, getting the pad back to where it should be. And yes, the pads are not pretty, but it's the only chance these things are going to get to work again, and they will need some trimming later on. Once in place, it was time to test. And after a bit of whirring, I got a list of contents. Now, most cartridges I have are not mine, in that they came with various bits of other eBay purchases, and I've never used them or tested them or checked them before, so I have no idea what's on them. But the first one being sort of successful, it was time to do the rest. The whole process took about 30 minutes, with a lot of swearing, but luckily no cuts or accidental damage to the tape. Eventually though I had a pile of cartridges ready to test. The aftermath of this is plain to see. The first one to try then was the official introduction cartridge from Sinclair. This seemed to have great trouble reading the cartridge, showing file not found errors. What a pity. I tried a few times. The cat command worked, showing the files, but they just wouldn't load. I moved on to the business cartridge next, and just the same thing. Very annoying. To rule anything else out, I tested the same Spectrum and the same Interface 1 and the same cable with the V-Drive, and that loaded perfectly. So that really points to the cartridges themselves. I cleaned the heads on the Mac drive and still no joy. Then, suddenly, out of nowhere, the introduction started to work. So I moved on, let's try the game cartridge then. No joy at all. Again, I could cap the cartridge but not load anything. I decided to move on to the rest of them then. This one failed to even detect the cartridge. This one just made an awful noise. This one just spam but did little else. Not looking good really. Then I found one that I could list, it had two files, LW and Triv, both not executable, so probably letters or documents, but sadly I couldn't get Taskword to load. At least not yet. Maybe there's a copy on another one of the carts. From the progress so far, if you can call it that, the more I tried, the better the chances were of the cartridges working. So maybe I just needed to keep pushing them in and out, maybe flatten the felt pad a little. After a few attempts, the game cart suddenly ran and got to the menu, and then failed to load ant attack. Hmm, maybe a bit more work needed on that one. The next cartridge had Elite on it, and what looked like two hacks. Moving on, and the next one failed. And so did the next one. Some of the contents could have been created by a multi-phase type device, or even a transfer program, as most were single files, like this one that had Wolf, Proto and Syst on it. I would assume that that would be Saberwolf, but not sure because it wouldn't load. A few cards I found had Taskword files on them. So I tried again with the business card. It made a valiant attempt to run Taskword, but failed. 
it seems to improve each time, so I'll keep trying. The only interesting thing I found was, well, nothing at all really. No hidden gems, no lost games. Just what you would expect from a normal user. A few password files, a few games, and that's about it. Before I packed it all up, I tried the business card one last time. And yes, password loaded. Right, back to those data cartridges then. There's a few letters. One about collecting tea towels and other interesting trivia. There's a flow diagram. You know, the usual stuff that you stored on MicroDrive back then. And I suppose one last attempt to load Ant Attack. Ah, it works. Just a quick game then. All things considered, including the felt pad issues, it's amazing that Interface 1 and the MicroDrive are still working after 40 years. When I had mine back in 1983-84, I used it daily despite me not being able to get any games copied to it. I stored my own games, I stored type-ins, and of course I ran my BBS from three of them. It was good to get it working again after all this time, but it's a pity those cartridges are really troublesome. Storing type-ins was better than using tape, although I did use that as well. Typing games in was a mixture of frustration, annoyance, learning and joy. Some magazines offered tapes you could buy instead of typing them in, and some magazines like 1648, they came on tape anyway and included the games. Your computer magazine used their own Telesoft service, where users who had modems could connect and download the typing games for themselves. But what if you didn't have a modem? Well, one solution was basic code. Whilst creating a Patreon video covering an issue of your computer, I came across this news item. A new radio show about computers was about to start, hosted by Barry Norman on Radio 4 called The Chip Shop. Hello and welcome once again to The Chip Shop. Well, now, back in 1604, and armed with the... the first episode aired on the 14th of January 1984, and covered mainly serious subjects. Still, a software version is what a firm called Oxford Digital Enterprises has now come up with, under the stirring title, Macbeth, the Computer Adventure Game. Later, a Saturday show on Radio 1 was set up with David Freeman and Mark Page, looking at all the news for home micros. There was also a telephone line you could call, called the Chip Line, where you could listen to pre-recorded messages from Barry, Mark and David. And another link show was called The Chip Shop Takeaway. Good morning and welcome to the Chip Shop Takeaway service. Today's computer programme is a game called Car Race. But just before we transmit the software, a few tips. On this show, the BBC would broadcast games for people to download into their home micros. Initially, those covered were Apple II and IIe, the BBC A and B, the Commodore 64, Pet and Vic 20, the Sharp MZ80, the ZX81, the Tandy TRS80 and the Video Genie. To be able to broadcast a single programme that suited all computers would be a problem. Different computers had different types of BASIC and were not compatible with each other. Luckily, an invention called BASIC code had been created in 1982 by NOS, a broadcasting company in the Netherlands. Basic code allowed a single pseudo basic listing to be converted into multiple different basic languages, and to do this, each micro needed a translation program. The program will be in a format known as basic code, a kind of Esperanto for computers. To be able to use this program, you must have a basic code kit, which consists of a cassette and a handbook and costs £3.95. I'll give you the address in a moment. Once the user had this program, they could then use it to translate the transmitted basic code into something they could run on their own computer. One suggested use for this was to allow people to swap their creations with each other, regardless of what computer they owned. NOS, along with Hobbycraft, already had many programs ready to be used, and the chip shop seemingly picked up the ones it wanted to broadcast. To get the translator, listeners had to send £3.95 to the BBC. In return, they got a tape containing translators for all the micros they supported, plus a manual. How did it work, though? Or did it work? Well, the translator held its own set of instructions, functions and subroutines for the target micro. Once loaded, it allowed the broadcast basic code to be loaded in, beyond line 1000 of basic. The translator's knew commands such as print, input, go to, go sub, return and so on. It knew functions like tab, abs, integer, square, sine, cosine, tangent and more. And it also knew operators like and, or, less than, greater than. 
Using these, it read every line of BEGSI code, looked up the equivalent target functions from its own translation library, and replaced them with the target machine's equivalent, and offered the user the options to run, modify or save the newly translated program. The translation program also held a set of subroutines to do various things, for example, GoSub100 would clear the screen, GoSub250 would generate a beep, and GoSub260 would generate a random number, and so on. Any programs written in basic code had to adhere to these and use these instead of using the machine's own capabilities. The program also had to start at line 1000, as anything above that would overwrite the basic code functions. Line 1000 to 1010 set out the memory requirements, 1011 to 19999 was the main code, and beyond that there were other sections for subroutines and data. This means that you couldn't just translate a basic typing game to run on basic code, it had to be in the specific format as set out in the manual. The system obviously had limitations, because it had to cope with the many different computers. For example, it could not use code that used a SID chip in the Commodore, because other machines just didn't have it. It also couldn't use user-definable graphics or sprites, because some machines like the ZX81 just didn't have them. That meant that programs would be very simple games, word puzzles or educational and reference material. All the same, this was intriguing me. What were the programs like? How did it work? Or in fact, did it work? Another problem was the quality of broadcast. Some areas had very poor signal, with a lot of interference, and this, of course, would ruin any chance of anything loading in. The BBC, though, had this advice. Radio 1, chip shop! First of all, tune in the radio accurately. Radio 1's frequencies are 1089 and 1053 kilohertz. That's 275 and 285 meters, medium wave. Secondly, switch off the Dolby or any filtering circuits on your cassette recorder. Then use a direct connection between your radio and cassette, not a microphone, because if the dog barks or the budgie tweets, you've had it. So now armed with a translator for Basic Code 2, I searched out some programs. It was very tricky to track down actual programs rather than just Basic Code ASCII listings, and we'll find out why later. I found an online browser version that allowed you to view all of the games from the BBC and NOS. You could try and play them, you could set the screen up for your target machine, and you could look at the listing. However, no matter what I did, I found this to be simply too quick to play the game. It did, as mentioned, let you look at the ASCII listing for the basic code programs, which would be useful later on. I then found a few WAV files taken from various tapes containing most of the games from the chip shop. I eagerly loaded up the translator using Spectacular's option to use real audio and tried to load a game, Car Race. And it failed. At this point, I was feeling like it was never going to happen, and that I would never see the games. And then I realised that there was a newer version called Basic Code 2 Plus. And now a completely new Basic Code translation program for the Sinclair 48K Spectrum. It seems there were different versions of the translator, and they were not fully compatible with earlier Basic Code programs. Well, great. Right, armed with this new version then, I tried again. And success, but there were errors. I found the problem in the way the translator interprets certain commands, or at least the way it was loaded. I fix this, and the game runs but draws the screen wrong. You can review the ASCII listings, as mentioned before, to get some idea of what the code should be doing, and then fix it in the ones that you've tried to load. Another quick delve through the code, removing a semicolon, and the game now runs. But it's very, very slow. This is a simple game where you control an ampersand being chased by a percent sign. You can jump in and out of the tracks, swapping lanes to avoid collisions. It's not fantastic, but it is working, and it is playable. I wonder how many people have seen this since it first appeared. It's interesting to see the translator running in 40 columns too. Maybe this is to maintain compatibility with the other machines. It's also interesting that the manual from Basic Code states that the Spectrum version is limited, in that it cannot save programs out to run on the machine. It has to always run from the translator. 
which explains why you just can't find these programs online. In fact, the Basic O2 Plus manual for version 8.02 of the translator does allow you to save programs to tape in either basic code format or as a sort of standalone program. It still needs the 40 column emulator taking up about 7k but when saved it just removes the translator's menu and goes straight to the game. So there's the first game then and I suppose now we're all set up we can look at the others. Looking at the basic code 2 tape inlay it was supplied with a few free games to try out. But as we know, the translator for that didn't work, or at least I couldn't get it to work, so I had to go in search to track down the game somewhere else. So finally, ignoring the non-game programs, the first game we come to is Word Game. Here the computer will display a word that is scrambled. The computer will begin to rebuild it, and when you know what it is, you have to press space and enter the correct word. If the computer beats you to it, it's won. OK, so it's not the best game, and probably could be found in quite a few type-ins. Let's move on to Sea Wars then. This wasn't on the tape, but it was available from the chip shop. Sadly, it fails to run, and the line number of the error shown doesn't make sense, because it looks fine to me. Anyway, we'll never see that one, sadly. Let's move on to Conqueror Kong, or Crazy Kong, depending on which tape you got it from. This also had a few errors that needed fixing. The idea of the game is you have to move around and remove the plugs on the platforms. To do this you move left, right, up and down, and also separate keys for jumping left and jumping right. You need to do this to jump over any holes you have left behind when you removed a plug. The game screen takes ages to draw, and if you die at any point, the whole screen is drawn again, putting all the plugs back that you'd previously removed. It's not greatly exciting, is it? And like all of the other games here, could easily be improved by adding user-definable graphics and ditching the translator altogether and writing your own version. Next is duck hunting. And I had to convert this to English using the listing online. There are only a few lines of instructions, but hey-ho, here we go. First you pick how many shots you want to take, and then the game begins. A lone hunter stands on the left, and after what seems like an eternity, a duck will appear. Come on, little duck, where are you? Ah, and when it's in line with your gun, you press space. And then if you're lucky, you shoot the duck. And you keep going until you've used all of the shots. And when you've done that, the game will tell you how well you've done, or in some cases, not. Sometimes the duck moves in two character squares, which means it's impossible to hit. So I think it's best if you left these to fly away. Let's move on then, and chords. Not really a game, but it does show you how to use various guitar chords. Placement of each finger is shown, along with variations in the chord itself. Useful if you were learning to play the guitar, I suppose, but not a game. But what is a game is the last one we're going to look at, Simple Pack. Before we can try this game though, we see a message asking us to edit the code. After doing this, we can play it. We see the instructions, and then can set the keys we want to move left, right, up and down. The maze draws slowly, much like every other thing we've tried so far. And then there is a painfully long wait before you can actually play the game. I'll edit it out because it soon gets boring. Right, off we go. The single monster just heads for your position, so you have to keep moving around eating the dots. As its name suggests, it's a simple Pac-Man game. And yes, there are better type-in versions of Pac-Man. So there it is, a brief history of Bexicode, along with some games probably not seen in over 30 plus years. Did anyone use this service, I wonder? Did anyone recognise any of these games? It would be interesting to know. The owner of one of the manuals that I have obviously had an Oric, but there must have been many other people with different machines out there who tried this. An interesting look then at a different service trying to provide games to different microcomputers using the same format. Basic Code evolved from this with newer versions arriving. Basic Code 3 arrived in 1986 and Basic Code 3C 
added luxuries like colour graphics, and that arrived in 1991. Despite the limitations, broadcasts of Basicode were still going in 1992. Because of the limitations, and the fact that it had to stick to certain things to get target machines working, Basicode faded away slowly. It was a very interesting part of computer history though, and one that many people may not be aware of. I normally type in games, but the odd utility often catches my eye, and this one from Popular Computing Weekly, April 1984, did just that. This magic little program will let you load in machine code games and convert them back to BASIC, so you can see how they're written. It was a small listing, so after a few minutes and armed with a few games ready to try, I ran it. Who didn't see that coming? I wonder how many people it caught out back in 1984. Oh well, a bit of fun at least. Previously I set up everything I needed to run my pretend business selling Spectrum games. Now I'm in full swing and the orders are coming in. As orders arrive, I need to generate an invoice and reduce stock, and this is all done in the stock control system. During the initial setup of the stock system, I tested out the invoice creation and it worked perfectly. Here's a draft invoice I printed out. Now, when I went to do it for real, for some reason it just wouldn't print. I had plenty of stock items, and I can print price lists and stock lists, but when doing an invoice, I just get the company name printed endlessly at the top of the sheet. Oh well, very annoying. I spent a few hours trying different things, but in the end I had to give up. Let's just pretend it worked, shall we? With the invoices processed, I can run a stock reorder report and see what things I need to order from the suppliers to replenish the games I've sold. I can use that to place a new order with Hobbit distribution for new stock items and even request a few new titles. How about Glass from Quicksilver, Sherlock from Melbourne House and Airwolf from Elite. Using Taskword again, I ordered these and at the same time I wrote a letter to Crash Magazine extending my advert and adding the new titles that I'd just purchased. Now I need to add the sales data to the finance package. Into small business accounts, I go into invoicing and add the details. I'm going to add all of the games that I've sold in a single invoice. It saves adding lots of multiple ones, with a grand total of £65.90. I can also add the new games that I've ordered at a cost of £27. To do this I go into the Purchases option and enter the details. With all that done I can review the balance sheet and see how things are looking. Once everything has been set up, moving forward is much quicker and easier. Using this I can run off reports to complete my VAT return, should I need to, or hand over to an accountant, if everything was real of course. With everything in place this is just now a rolling system, and once a month I can enter the things I've sold, enter the things I've bought, and update the stock system. And that appears to be it. I did it! I set up a pretend business, and all of the things I needed to manage it, and it's all working fine. Over this series I've attempted to prove that the Spectrum could be used to run a small business, and although this may sound trivial, it was far from that. The initial purchase of the hardware would deter most people, but it was needed to avoid lengthy waits for tape loading, and of course, the printer was essential. I had hoped that picking a disk interface that was compatible with Sinclair's own microdrive commands would make things easier, but again, that was far from the truth. 
most of the usable programs had to be modified to work with that. Some tried to format the cartridge first, and others tried to use the verify or erase commands, which caused a few headaches with the plus D. Even the ones designed to work with micro drives, for example the writer, failed to do so for things I could never get to the bottom of. All too often I found myself digging through basic code and changing various lines just to get something that worked from disk. This could rule out a lot of programs for people who are not comfortable doing this. At least the majority of packages were written in BASIC, or partly BASIC, which meant modifying them was fairly easy for someone with a bit of knowledge. I must admit though, setting up and seeing the final hardware was brilliant, if a huge relief. The software designed to implement business processes was far from professional, with possibly the exception of word processors. And because I limited the selection to the early 80s, some of the more professional and later products were excluded. The very first package I set up caused no end of problems, and I had to dig through the code to remove the format command. The stock control package once set up though worked really well, apart from right at the very end, where for some reason it failed to produce invoices. Spreadsheets were also a problem. Only a few modern ones that were out of scope used 42 or 64 character display so the ones I evaluated were all limited to 32 characters. This restricted the view significantly. I looked at a few finance packages and most of them were pretty basic. Sadly the one I picked had no instructions, but it was written in basic, so I could at least have a chance of modifying it. In the end though, it failed when converting it to disk. I wanted to use a DTP package. and I do own one, but it's for the plus three. The 48k version available doesn't seem to work properly. Maybe the plus three version is something I will try in a future episode. The database, which I hoped would be easy, again proved troublesome. Now much of this can be put down to the fact that I wasn't actually using Interface 1 and a microdrive, but programs claiming to be compatible should really behave that way. But then again, the plus D also claims to be compatible, but in reality, it is not. It disallows the copy command for printers, something that's used in quite a few packages, and it's also not happy with some erase commands. So to answer my original question then, could a Spectrum be used to run a small business? Well the answer is definitely yes, but it's not easy. You need a lot of spare cash to buy the kit, a knowledge of basic and microdrive commands, and a lot of spare time. Once it's all set up though, it's certainly feasible to do, but the setting up would send many users crazy, as it did myself almost. Looking at the cost then, and this does not include buying multiple different programs until you find one that works. As you can see, at the time of creating this, the equivalent would be spending more or less £2,470 on computer equipment. Even today you can buy a decent computer and printer for probably a lot less than that. I do admit though, that after many days and months of messing about with the stock control programs, spreadsheets, word processors and things, I can't wait to have a go on Jetpack. Could I have done things differently? Well, yes, I could have opted to use a ZX Microdrive, and that would have eliminated probably most of the problems that I had. And it would have allowed me to use some other packages that I wanted to use, like the Writer or OmniCalc. I could have chosen to use a Kempston printer interface, which hopefully would have had better support than the Plus G generic Epson compatible one. But all of these things are in the past now. It's easy to look back and see what went wrong. But with hard work and perseverance, a lot of things went right. In the next series, I'll be looking at some other programs I didn't use. Maybe set them up on a microdrive and see what they're really like. If I can find the energy, that is. Right, where's Jetpack? Taking a sidestep for a minute, or maybe five, something I've been looking to do for a while was to locate a replacement modern motherboard that would sit inside a 48K Spectrum case, and if possibly, use the same keyboard. In essence, I wanted a modern Spectrum. After a bit of research, I opted for this, the Sisyph 512. This is not a paid promotion, I didn't get this free to review it, I purchased it. So this will be a good honest review. It's available on eBay from a seller called Jimmy Death, and the guy sells them on a regular basis as he completes them. When it arrived, I found it was a neat little board. It uses the ULA replacement chip, and has additional small daughter boards supplied with it that give Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. 
Using these, though, was not recommended in a 48K case due to possible ventilation issues. It's better to use them in a 48K plus case if you needed to use them anyway. For me, I didn't really need them because that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for something I could put inside a normal case that would do everything and more that a normal 48K machine could do, but running on modern hardware. Let's have a look at the specifications then. The board includes a DivMMC with an SD card slot. It has a compatible edge connector. It's got a built-in joystick port that can be set as Kempston compatible. It has a video out that uses the same cable as a Mega Drive, more or less, but there's one supplied anyway. There's a reset button and an NMI button, and it also maintains the sound input and output of the original in case you want to load games via tape. It can emulate machines from the 16K up to the Pentagon, and it has a real Z80 CPU with changeable speeds up to 14 MHz. It's got 512K of RAM and a real AY sound chip, so it's definitely feature rich. It's also got, importantly, connectors for the original Sinclair keyboard ribbon cables, which is exactly what I wanted. If you're going to use the expansion port, it's a good idea to disable things like the DivMMC on board, as they could be compatibility problems. You'll notice during this review that my TV has some slight artifact problems on the left-hand side of the screen, and I must emphasize that this is not the Sisyph itself, this is my TV with a slightly dodgy SCART connector. Right, the first thing we need to do is put it inside a case. As you'll notice, because of all these extra connections, the case needs to be modified. I bought a brand new clear case, a new keyboard membrane and keyboard mat and cover from ZX Renew, and set about the modifications. Eventually it was ready and the board fits in perfectly, aligning with the existing screw holes. I used the original ZX power supply to power it, plugged it all in, and turned it on. Now this is not going to be a massive in-depth review. It's not going to cover every tiny element of this device, but I'm going to have a play with it and see if I can indeed use it as a spectrum replacement, without the worry of older components failing. To get to the option screen, you press and hold the NMI button. And here you can set the different modes, as well as changing some advanced options. Let's start in 48k mode then, and the game I always go to to test things like CPU timings, Aquaplane. Now Aquaplane uses a split border effect, which relies very much on accurate CPU timings. And it works perfectly, the border is aligned, and the game works as you would expect. Moving on to Night Law, a 48k title. And yes, it works flawlessly. Nice graphic output, and the sound is sent through the SCART too, so it sounds really good. So normal games seem to work fine. Let's try out some multicoloured games then. Again, these rely on exact CPU timings to force the spectrum to show more colours per character square than normal. Let's go with Sunbucket. And yes, it all looks very good to me, and a great game too. No problems with multicoloured tiles or effects anywhere. Moving on then to ULA+. This extends the Spectrum's palette, giving 64 colours, and there are a few games that were written to use it, including one of my own, Toofy's Winter Nuts. If you look closely, you will see slightly different shades within the graphics. This mode can only be used in clones or emulators though, but as you can see, it works fine. Now on to 1 to 8K titles. How about Adam's Family? Let's hear that AY sound. Now as you can see, I'm not very good at this game, but also you can see that it works fine. Let's try a more modern game then, Metal Man Reloaded. Yep, no problems at all, and another great game. Now things that push the machine to the limits are usually demos, so let's have a look at some demos then.
yes, they all look fantastic. Now what about that overclocking option? You can step through the various speeds, with the default being 3.5 MHz. Now, here's the intro to Elite. Concentrate on the speed of that rotating ship. Now if we switch up to 14 MHz, and we can certainly see the difference, much faster and much more smoother. Using this could improve gameplay in games like Hard Driving, where the original Z80 really struggled. On to the Pentagon modes then, and I'm not too familiar with this machine, so I'll use some files supplied on the SD card. Here's Aladdin, loading from a TRD disk image, and how about a cross demo? Yes, all works good. Now, what about one of those demos that tests the timings? Okay, how about this one? ZE Best or Z Best? As you can see, it works fine, being able to use the border for graphics. Overall, I like this. It's a modern replacement, as I've said, for the original Sinclair motherboard. It's got plenty of added extras, should you need to use them. And I haven't even looked at the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth bits yet. Obviously, the Wi-Fi will allow you to connect to Wi-Fi networks and do whatever you want to do with it. And the Bluetooth board will let you connect to things like mobile phones and load games via that method. But I said at the beginning, this wasn't one of the things I was looking to do. You also get a PS2 keyboard adapter, so if you want, you could use a PS2 keyboard and put this motherboard inside another case, of a totally different style. Me though, I want it inside a nice specky case, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth don't really interest me at this moment in time. The SD card has plenty of storage for anything I need to load and with a slightly modified case, it's easy to take in and out. So I suppose you all want to know, does it play Jetpack? Yes, of course it does. Okay, so we're near the end now. How about some fun? This is Bruce Lee, released by US Gold Stroke Datasoft in 1985. This game will be familiar to most of you, but how many of you actually read the inlay and know what the story is? Bruce is looking for infinite wealth and immortality, and to get it, he has to find a wizard in a mysterious fortress. Not really a Bruce Lee plot, is it? Carrying on then, some rooms are hidden and can only be revealed when you collect lanterns. During your journey, you will be, and this is what the inlay says, attacked by the ninja brandishing their broken sticks. Oh dear. So rich is this wizard, yet he won't give his protecting ninjas proper weapons. Anyway, onto the game then, and it's a brilliant platform fighting game. You can climb vines, waterfalls, you can duck, jump and attack the ninja, and the more dangerous green Yamu but he's not actually green on screen. Some screens have booby traps that I think are mines and they explode when you run over them, but they can be used to kill the ninja and yamo as well if you get your timing right. Doors and floors open up once you collect enough lanterns and progress is exciting, as you don't know what's coming next, at least when you play through it the first time. Now let's freeze this here. I mentioned that the Yamu were not green, and really the main sprite doesn't look like Bruce Lee. But Alan Turvey did a makeover of this game, and released it in 2019, and he made it even better. So, moving on with that game then, 
The main sprite looks like Bruce Lee, and the Yammo is green, and the scenery has had a coat of paint. The whole game shines now. It's exactly the same game underneath, but it looks a lot brighter and cleaner. Some rooms have tricky moving floors, some have swords overhead, some have vanishing floors, and some you have to cling onto the vines on the roof. There's a lot of different mechanics in this game, and it makes it really great to play. It isn't exactly difficult, so you can get a good way through before you start getting into problems, and you can enjoy every screen. Towards the end though, there are a few tricky rooms, especially one with multiple moving objects, roof vines, and other things, and you need perfect timing to get through it. But it is the penultimate room though. The owner of my version wrote their high score on the inlay, which goes back to the chat that Jeff and I had earlier in a previous episode. But it's not a bad score to be honest, probably completed the game twice looking at it. Overall then, a fantastic game, and if by some miracle you have not yet played it, definitely give it a go. Here is Cracky, from Inofuto, released in 2023. This game looks very much like an arcade game, but it's written to look like that. It isn't, as far as I know, based on any real game, but it certainly has the look and feel of something to be found in seaside arcades from the 80s. simple idea, collect the stars and avoid the chasing enemy. Some parts of the floor collapse when you move over them, and you can drop down from any height, which is a great advantage. Using the ladders and holes, you need to complete the level to move on, and things get progressively harder as you go. The graphics, as you can see, are really nice, and I especially like the main character. The sound is good with some great music and tunes and nice spot effects. I really enjoyed this game, and certainly recommend you check it out. <laughs> 